The North Korean government has consistently claimed to have no COVID-19 cases within the country. But reports from a number of independent sources suggest otherwise. The DPRK was one of the first movers in closing its borders very early in the pandemic in February 2020. Sources including NK Pro, Daily NK, Rimjin Gang, the South Korean government and others have claimed that COVID has indeed gotten loose in the DPRK, as it has almost everywhere else in the world. So my goal in this video is to tease out the implications of the COVID pandemic for North Korea and think about how COVID might become a threat multiplier for the other fragilities of the DPRK state that we've examined previously. Now, this will be my most speculative of the videos I present to you this semester. North Korea's border closures have made it harder to get information about what's going on in the country, and it's harder to corroborate sources and to verify the stories that are coming out. Nonetheless, it's not a complete information black hole. We can make inferences from official statements and observable government actions, and we can hypothesize about the likely impacts of COVID based on the trajectories of other disasters and shock events that we've seen there. Like, for example, the environmental shocks that we've examined previously, they're very instructive in this regard. So with these important caveats in mind, let's dive in. In this video, I'll begin by looking at the history of pandemic disease in Korea, including the impact of the 1919 Spanish flu pandemic. I'll look at North Korea's COVID-19 response measures today, and the impacts of COVID and associated response measures on North Korean society. Then we'll weigh up the systemic implications of COVID-19 for the North Korean state. And then I'll wind up with a summary. North Korea's COVID-19 quarantine measures have been amongst the strongest in the world, including restrictions on cross-border and regional movement. So consider this, on January 25th, 2020, the DPRK shut down its border. It switched to a state-run emergency quarantine system. It organized a pan-ministerial organization called the Central People's Committee for Health. And it established emergency command centers for COVID response at the provincial, county, and municipal levels. Now, these are not measures that the government would take if there was no COVID threat. These measures didn't emerge from nowhere. North Korea has extensive recent experience to draw from in managing infectious disease outbreaks. But there's historic memory here that also informs how North Korea is handling this. Indeed, if we go back to the Japanese colonial period, we can see echoes in the epidemiological responses to pandemic disease, along with some of the potential political consequences as well. The 1919 Spanish flu hit Korea hard, as it did countries across the world. My excellent colleague Christopher Richardson has written about this extensively on the website SinoNK, where he writes that during the first wave of the Spanish flu, a new Korean nationalism emerged on a wave of anger at the colonial administration's mishandling of the flu pandemic. This desperation is captured in the quote on the slide here, from doctors Frank Schofield and Sin Hyun Chang, who were both working at a hospital in Seoul in 1919, and they're pictured here on the right. Take a moment to pause the video and read this quote. It's worth digesting. Many people on the front lines of the March 1st movement in 1919 were also on the front lines of the civil society response to the Spanish flu pandemic, which was then ravaging the land. And that included the father of Kim Il-sung, who we know would later rule North Korea. Kim Il-sung's father, Kim Hyun-jik, is pictured here on the right with his family, including a young Kim Il-sung. It's not difficult for us, experiencing the chaotic politics of the COVID pandemic, to imagine how the Spanish flu could have been the trigger that brought pre-existing anti-colonial anger to the surface as a protest movement. As Christopher Richardson notes in his article, only two events killed more Koreans in the 20th century than the pandemic of 1918 to 1921. And that's the Korean War and the arduous march. 
Events of this magnitude shape societies. They shape the politics and cultures of those societies for generations to come. The Spanish flu ravaged Korea in a series of waves from 1918 to 1921. And over the course of the pandemic, over half of Korea's population of 17 million people were infected with the Spanish flu, with over 200,000 people losing their lives. The first wave struck during the harvest period of 1918, which had a ripple impact on the food supply at a time when Japan was already appropriating the produce of Korean agriculture to satisfy the needs of consumers back in Japan. The cost of fuel, charcoal and firewood also soared as the country moved into the cold of winter. Factories were shuttered and other workplaces had to close to stop the spread of the disease that left many Koreans without work during that period. The Japanese colonial government introduced mask mandates and banned public assemblies. And they also ordered Koreans to avoid weddings, funerals and ancestral rites. The photo here is from Japan in 1919, showing schoolgirls masked up for walking to school. So that's very similar to what you would have seen in Korea at the same time as well. These measures were, and do remain, sensible basic epidemiological responses to slowing the spread of an infectious disease. However, such measures never occur in a vacuum. They're always influenced by the prevailing politics and socioeconomic conditions of the moment. At a time when the colonial administration was already seen as ruthlessly suppressing Korean culture, these public health measures seem to many like a pretext for further social and cultural control, however necessary they were to protect the population from disease. As the American author Mark Twain once said, history never repeats, but it often rhymes. It's no accident that the incidence of protest sounds familiar to the protests against health restrictions that we've seen worldwide during the COVID pandemic. While I don't, however, want to suggest an exact parallel, the protests of our time today do represent an explosion of pre-existing grievances for which the pandemic and its restrictions are a trigger. There's obviously so much that's different between 1919 and now. And in suggesting a historic echo, I'm not endorsing the content of today's protests. The important point to note is the relevance of pandemic and associated public health measures as a spark that sets alight pre-existing grievances. And the North Korean government is no doubt very aware of the potential for the eruption of protest against the Kim regime that's possible in this moment. This is why the North Korean government has taken decisive measures in response to more recent infectious disease outbreaks, both with COVID and prior to COVID. So back in 2003, there was a significant outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, which spread from East Asia to Europe, North and South America, before being contained. Now, like COVID, SARS is also a coronavirus, but unlike COVID, the 2003 SARS outbreak did not escalate into a global pandemic. Governments in the impacted countries did, however, institute control measures, including lockdowns in some cases. North Korea, for its part, responded to the SARS outbreak by declaring that foreigners coming into North Korea would have to obtain special approval to travel to the country beyond the levels of approval that are already there. It quarantined people coming from SARS affected countries for 10 days in Anju, which is in North Pyongan province. Inbound and outbound flights from Beijing were suspended for one month. And in total, the SARS quarantine and travel restrictions lasted for nearly four months in 2003. The North Korean government enacted similar responses to the Ebola outbreak in Africa in 2014 and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome outbreak or MERS in 2015. Now, while the MERS response was warranted given North Korea's proximity to South Korea, which was one of the impacted countries, North Korea's response to the World Health Organization's warning about Ebola in Africa was widely seen as unnecessary overkill. The North Korean government even claimed that it de had developed a cure for MERS, which you can see illustrated in the vials on the right-hand side of the graphic here. 
As we know, national borders became an important line of defence in attempting to slow the initial spread of COVID-19 at the beginning of the pandemic. And there were sound epidemiological reasons for doing this at the time, because people with a viral host, restricting the movement of people, slowed the spread of the virus or attempted to slow the spread of the virus. On that basis, the DPRK government enacted all kinds of movement restrictions, including, including closing its external borders and enforcing a 30-day quarantine period for those rare foreign nationals who were permitted to enter the country. There were no commercial flights permitted in or out of North Korea and no cross-border train services to China and Russia. Disinfection centres were established at railway stations and airports to eventually facilitate the movement of goods into North Korea, like the one that's pictured here at Weiju. It's also implemented even more onerous domestic travel restrictions between cities and regions than those that were already normally in place. So it's beefed up those internal travel restrictions. Mask mandates came into effect almost immediately in North Korea from the 4th of February, 2020. And that mask mandate remained in place until April 2021. And mask wearing remains strongly encouraged in North Korea, but it isn't mandatory. Nonetheless, the uptake of mask wearing remains very high by all reports. And that's interesting because mask wearing is not politicized in North Korea in the same way that it's been politicized through culture war bullshit in Australia, in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world. Also, as, an, as a funny aside, it's interesting to see that some things remain universal worldwide, like the guys on the bottom left here who can't seem to figure out how to put their masks on properly. Also interesting to see has been the much lower frequency of Kim Jong-un's public appearances during the pandemic, which suggests a cautious approach from the leader to COVID exposure. Key North Korean events and anniversaries have been consequently affected. Since the beginning of the pandemic, a number of key events and important anniversaries have been amended, delayed or cancelled. But look at this photo. When Kim Jong-un does come out in public, you'll never see him wearing a mask, even though everyone else around him will be. And this is significant because the public appearances of the leader are intended to communicate strength and stability to the people as a manifestation of the personalised connection between the people and the leader that's intended through the regime's cult of personality. Conversely, not being in public and cancelling important events sends the message to the people that all is not well. Finally, on vaccines, North Korea is a participant in the international initiative called COVAX, which is coordinated by the World Health Organization. COVAX is a global collaboration which was intended to accelerate the development, production and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments and vaccines. And the goal of COVAX was to end the acute phase of the pandemic by providing doses for at least 20% of the recipient country's populations. Globally, COVAX hasn't gone to plan as developing countries have been priced out of the market for vaccines by the vaccine hoarding activities of wealthier states. For its part, North Korea initially rejected an offer of COVAX from COVAX of 3 million doses of the Chinese manufactured Sinovac vaccine. A later shipment of 1.7 million doses of AstraZeneca was delayed indefinitely because North Korea didn't have the appropriate technical preparedness for the handling and storage of this particular vaccine. Pyongyang, for its part, cited global supply chain shortage as a factor in its delay. The World Health Organization, however, argued that North Korea rejected the AstraZeneca allocation, after which its allocation of vaccines was reallocated to other countries within the COVAX system. Nonetheless, even if North Korea did receive all of its allocated vaccines from COVAX right now, its total allocation of 4,670,000 doses is only enough to cover around 2,335,000 people. Or in percentage terms, that's only roughly 9% of North Korea's total population. 
So this accessibility issue, again, brings into sharp relief North Korea's political and socioeconomic hierarchies, in this case highlighting the priority access that regime elites will have to vaccines at the expense of the rest of the population. You will recall this human security framework from the video on North Korea's environmental vulnerabilities, highlighting the seven different interrelated elements of human security. So remember the key insight from when I introduced this, which is that each of these seven elements is interdependent with the others and they each shape each other dynamically and in changing ways. COVID is a health security threat that has a detri detrimental impact across the other six areas of human security, but also the pre-existing problems in those other areas of human security have made the COVID health security threat worse as well. So this is another example of the threat multiplier effect. In particular here, I want to highlight the relationship between COVID, health security, food security, economic security and political security to demonstrate the ripple effects of COVID as a shock event for North Korean society. Let's start with health security and contextualize North Korea's health system. Now here I'm drawing on the work of my Deakin University colleague, Melanie Brook from the Center for Humanitarian Leadership. Brook finds that given the underlying weakness of the healthcare system and vulnerability of the population, it remains to be seen whether the scale of support available will be sufficient to tangibly reduce the potential impact of COVID-19. Now, why would Melanie Brook make this assertion? Well, North Korea's health infrastructure, and particularly outside of Pyongyang, is extremely limited. Also, you've got underlying vulnerabilities related to food security, malnutrition, and chronic disease. So this means that any COVID-19 outbreak could have a potentially devastating impact on the population. In February 2020, at the very beginning of the pandemic, the DPRK humanitarian country team from the UN identified 8.7 million North Koreans as in need of humanitarian health intervention in 2020 due to a lack of essential medicines and equipment. If a North Korean person has to go to hospital, they have to pay for the doctors and pay to provide everything necessary for the operation or procedure that they're having themselves. And since there's a lack of medical equipment and a lack of, ed of medicine in North Korean hospitals, patients must get together everything that's required for their treatment themselves. So this is an enormous burden on the pers any person that wants medical treatment. Now, if we rewind back to the Kim Il-sung era, North Koreans were provided with universal health care and generally received better medical care than they do today. But since the famine, the medical system generally now only caters to the upper classes. According to a defector who was interviewed by NK News, only the top 1% actually enjoys free health care. Maybe 20% of people can afford to pay a doctor and the rest of the society wouldn't even dare to think of going to visit a doctor because they just can't pay for it. The hospital that you see pictured here is one of the few that cater to the wealthy elite. But also North Korean defectors have reported extremely rudimentary conditions in North Korea's hospitals for those that have actually been in one. North Korean hospitals have no electricity or heating during many periods. So doctors are forced to perform surgeries using battery powered flashlights for lighting. And it's not unusual for people to undergo painful surgery without anesthetics so that they can save money and get the procedure done. COVID presents particular challenges for this already weak healthcare system. According to the UN's Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID-19, this explains that while the scope of and testing capacity in North Korea remains unclear, the increased COVID-19 screening and hospitalization might strain the already overburdened system and come at the expense of other vulnerable groups, including pregnant and lactating mothers, children, older people, and those suffering from pre-existing conditions. Now we know that COVID nearly collapsed Australia's health system uh, during 2020, 2021, over the summer period, 
And Australia's healthcare system is relatively strong by global standards. So imagine that the impact of a major COVID wave, what that would have on the North Korean health system. Remember the talk of flattening the curve back in 2020 when the COVID pandemic was kicking off? The idea was to slow the rate of growth of new infections to keep the wave of infections from overwhelming the hospital system. We can interpret the extreme COVID response measures of the North Korean government in this context, where the curve doesn't actually have to be very large to throw its healthcare system into complete disarray. We should also consider the impact of international economic sanctions on North Korea, which have had a direct long-term impact on the North Korean health system. Sanctions prohibit the import of computers and various other metal objects to North Korea, which restricts the ability of North Korean hospitals to repair medical equipment. So the fragility of the medical system is something that's occurred over time. It's been run down over time. Uh, and the international economic sanctions have played a part in that. It's not the only reason, but they've played a part. In the context of COVID, there are reported shortages of testing equipment and people with testing expertise. There are shortages of personal protective equipment, such as gloves, protective suits, and respiratory protective equipment. And as a result, according to many North Korean defectors, sick people have had to rely on smuggled medicine or illicit drugs to treat themselves. The UN, for its part, has granted some sanctions exemptions for some international organizations to send equipment like thermometers, portable ventilators, resuscitators, gloves, face shields, surgical masks and gowns, and goggles to North Korean hospitals. So these organizations include the WHO, the Inter International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and Doctors Without Borders. So those sanctions and exemptions, they're only available for a, a select few organizations to send stuff in. Internal movement restrictions have placed limitations on the capacity of people and of goods to move around. For the agricultural sector, this has limited the ability of farms to plant and harvest crops and to transport their harvests to consumers. The food distribution system, which was already limited in scope and resources, is under pressure too. Food imports from China, which are sold in North Korea's Jungmadung markets, have since the early 2000s provided an important buffer against a more widespread food shock in the DPRK. However, North Korea's COVID border closures have severely limited, severely restricted food imports from China and effectively removed this buffer, placing greater stress on the food system. Movement restrictions have had an impact on supply chains as well, which makes food more expensive, pricing many people out of the market. So this means more people suffering from malnourishment, which in and of itself is a terrible thing. But malnourished people are also immunocompromised, which makes them more susceptible to catch COVID and either die or suffer long-term health impacts. The common pattern worldwide seems to be that COVID has turbocharged pre-existing patterns of personal insecurity. Therefore, in the North Korean case, we can theorize that COVID vulnerability will be shaped by the Songun class hierarchy and the economic stratification of wealth through marketization. So if you're part of the wavering or the hostile classes in the Songbun system, you're unlikely to be able to get proper health treatment if you become ill and certainly not get into hospital. Even if you're in the core class, you still need to have foreign currency to be able to afford entry into the hospital system. So this clearly illustrates the two different axes of social stratification in the DPRK today, Songbun and money. Please note though that I'm theorizing this COVID vulnerability profile by class and wealth rather than claiming it outright because there's insufficient data being released by the North Korean government to make a claim definitively. Given what we've seen pretty much elsewhere, everywhere else in the world though through the pandemic and given what we know about social stratification in North Korea in general, I think this is a pretty reasonable hypothesis.
This moment right now is the most dire crisis North Korea has faced since the arduous march. And with that in mind, a key question arises. How might this cascade of human insecurities manifest into political effects? And what are the implications of the COVID crisis for the stability and longevity of the Kim regime? Recall from previous videos that North Korea's economy is now significantly marketized, and that includes the food system, which we see through the Jiangmudang markets. Marketization has integrated North Korea into the Chinese economic orbit, and food imports from China have been a significant buffer against food insecurity, which took some of the pressure off the North Korean state to distribute food. Now, in the 1990s, during the arduous march, it was the collapse of the centralized public distribution system that catalyzed the famine. However, in today's more marketized food system, it could be market failure and high food prices that are, ca that are the catalyst for a new food shock. So what I'm watching closely for here is the capacity of key elites in the party and the Korean People's Army to weather the food shock, along with wealthier members of the Dunju class. Another X factor right now is North Korea's unilateral COVID border closures with China and to see how quickly those border closures end up being opened up again. We've seen previously in North Korea that to survive, the Kim regime has had to pivot and to reorganize itself in order to stay in power. So, for example, looking back, Kim Il-sung developed Juche as a survival adaptation to navigate the Sino-Soviet split. Kim Jong-il responded to the challenge of the arduous march by instituting Songun politics and positioning the Korean People's Army as the primary actor in the North Korean economy. Now, I'm watching to see if Kim Jong-un devises a similar kind of reorientation in response to the COVID crisis and what impact that might have on the structure of the economy, the power balance between the institutions of the state and the evolution of official ideology. So are there any signs that Kim Jong-un is responding to the current crisis with some kind of pivot? Well, hard to say, but there are signs of movement. In April 2021, Korean Central News Agency reported that Kim, during a high-level political meeting, had urged the people to undertake another arduous march. In June 2021, Kim admitted that North Korea was facing a tense food situation. The people's food situation is now getting tense as the agricultural sector failed to fulfill its grain production plan due to the damage of the typhoon last year, quote unquote. Now, this is interesting because this illustrates the intersection of an already struggling agricultural sector with both environmental disasters and with the impact of COVID. In December 2021, the official newspaper Nodong Shinmun reported on Kim Jong-un's speech to the fourth plenary meeting of the 8th Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea, which is pictured here. This, this graphic is an excerpt from Nodong Shinmun on this. So in this important speech, Kim announced a new rural development plan to address food insecurity, stressing the importance of, quote, solving current rural issues to boost the agricultural production of the country, unquote. As North Korea analyst Peter Ward has argued in NK News, the fact that the government is talking about a food crisis is an official admission that the food situation is already really bad. And they've not done this for quite some time. So using this language publicly of the arduous march is a very strong indicator that all's not well in the food system. So watch this space. I think this is a pivotal moment for the contemporary times of North Korea. But if you're an ordinary person in North Korea, what survival adaptations are available to you in the current crisis? The coping strategies of individuals for food during the arduous march were predicated on mobility, like foraging for food or even fleeing the country. Or they were predicated on theft, barter and trade to get food or growing some of your own food. Now in the current crisis, Mobility has been heavily restricted and the food markets have shrunk because of the border closures with China. So as ever, 
Being able to grow some of your own food is a prudent coping strategy for survival. It remains to be seen how the state responds to people's survival needs in the short to medium term. So again, this is part of that watch that space because uh, there's important things in train at the moment. There's a few generalizable lessons that are worth noting on North Korea's experience with COVID, as well as from the story of the Spanish flu in occupied Korea in 1919. So for one, there's nothing unique about many of the standard public health measures that are employed in pandemics, particularly in relation to masks and what we call now social distancing. And this has been common practice across societies from at least the Black Plague in Europe during the 14th century. Pandemics cause political rupture, and the extent of that rupture depends on the level of pre-existing stress that a society is already under when a pandemic hits. In this respect, the COVID pandemic is similar to environmental disasters in that it's a threat multiplier. And also a lesson I always took away from the arduous march, which is amplified now by the COVID related food shock in the DPRK is the importance of people growing some of their own food. Given the disruptions of supply chains, recurring environmental disasters and energy price hikes, among other things that even we're experiencing here in Australia recently, I think growing your own food is good advice as a positive adaptation to the times wherever you are, even here in Australia. As always, here's a summary of key points based on today's video. But please don't be afraid to add and amend this rubric as you see fit, depending on what you're reading from the material this week. Oh